Last week we started this sermon series on Paul's letter to the Philippians. And the goal that I said at that time was that we want people to fall in love with their Bible. And we've been trying to do this for years and years. And I finally decided, look, the reality is that the Bible is a great big heavy book, lots of pages. It's difficult to understand. A lot of names in here you cannot pronounce, I cannot pronounce. And one of the ways I think you can fall in love with the Bible is falling in with love with one small part of the Bible. And I don't know of a better way to start than Paul's letter to the Philippians. It's four chapters long, about five pages probably in your Bible, can be read easily in one sitting. It's pretty easy to understand, although there are great deep theological insights here. And what makes Philippians so terrific is that Paul, as is, is typical of Paul, has these great deep theological insights, but they have great practical relevance for your life and mine. So we're going to be preaching over the next several weeks, uh, skipping around in the letter to the Philippians. It's not a Bible study, but we're going to be t- dealing with some of these wonderful, really powerful texts. So last week we dealt with the third chapter, verses 12, 13, and 14, called Moving On Part 1. Today, the same text, Moving On Part 2. And uh, I'm going to read that text for you, and then we're going to jump in to the second half of this particular passage. It's on the screen for you. Paul writes these words to the church at Philippi. He says, Not that I have already obtained this or have already reached the goal, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Beloved, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but this one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind, Those are the words we preached on last week, forgetting what lies behind. If you didn't catch that sermon, you might want to go back. It's on the website and the video cast or podcast. Forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the heavenly call of God in Christ Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I bought my first vehicle in 1964, I think it was. It was a 1949 Chevrolet pickup truck. Those of you who are as old as I and lived in Texas back in those years know that in those days, if you lived in Texas, you could get your driver's license at the age of 14. It's a scary thought these days, isn't it? But my twin brother and I got our driver's license at the age of 14, and we found this 1949 pickup truck. We paid $100 for it. Looking back, I finally figured this out after 50 years or whatever it's been. That was back in the day when teenagers liked to do a lot of drag racing. Speed was, you know, it was all about speed. And I think my father let us buy this truck because it was so old that it wouldn't go very fast. It had a little uh, V6 engine in it, and I think he feared that we couldn't get into much trouble in that old pickup truck. He was wrong, of course. I think we'd only had it two or three days before we got it stuck in the mud. Now, one of the, the things about pickup trucks is that they are seductive. Everybody, I don't care whether it's a young teenager or an old man, Everybody who buys their first truck believe that they are buying a vehicle which will not get stuck in the mud. Let me just tell you that nothing could be further from the truth. I've had a ton of pickup trucks through the years. These days I drive one with four-wheel drive, and I've gotten them all stuck in the mud. Pickup trucks don't really do that well in the mud. But the point I want to make to you this morning is after through these years, I've gotten so many trucks stuck, stuck in the mud, and there is nothing more frustrating. I mean, you're sitting there, you're, you're totally stuck. You can't do anything until the farmer comes along with the tractor, pulls you out of the mud. Getting stuck in a pickup truck is nothing compared to getting stuck in life. Paul knew what it was like to be stuck in life. He'd been stuck in this a phase of his life where he'd been self-righteous, where he'd been a Pharisee, where he had so easily condemned other human beings. And then there came this moment on the road to Damascus where he'd been struck to his knees, struck blind. And for him, all of a sudden, life began anew. It was life in relationship with Jesus Christ. It was a new understanding of who God was in his life. And so he knew what it was like to have a former life and to have 
new life in Jesus Christ. And so he writes these powerful words. Not that I have already obtained this, I've already reached this, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on for the prize of the heavenly call of God in Christ Jesus in my life. So I want to talk this morning about what it means to move forward. But before I do that, I want to say just another word about what it means to forget what lies behind. I'm not going to re-preach my sermon from last week. Like I say, you can get that on the, on the website. But I think it's important for us to acknowledge that Paul knew that you cannot get unstuck in life without forgetting what lies behind. Because we've all been there, haven't we, at one time or another? It's really, really easy to get stuck in life. For instance, you can get stuck in a job that you absolutely hate, but you don't know what to do about it. Or you can get stuck in a job that's not really bad, but it's boring to the point that it's killing you. And you wonder, how can I get out of this place? Dare I talk, uh, say a word about marriage? We all know how difficult marriage is, and so you may have been at that place where you were stuck in a painful marriage. How do you get out of that spot? Almost everybody at some point gets stuck in a place where the marriage is just ordinary or boring, and that's not much fun either. And then there's the usual list of places where we get stuck. We have a death of a loved one, get, get, go into a place of grief or sadness or depression, addiction, all the typical suspects. Every single one of us knows what it means to get stuck and to need to get to a new place in life. And so Paul reminds us that the first thing you have to do is to somehow move out of the past by forgetting the past and forgiving the past. Now, through the years, I've preached on forgiveness a lot. It's in the Lord's Prayer. I encourage you to pray it every single day. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who have trespassed against us. It can be a powerful prayer, but whenever I encourage people to do this, I am reminded of the fact that some people have been hurt in ways that are truly unspeakable. Years ago, a friend of mine, a colleague, said to me, Don, the problem with you is that you've never been a victim. And she was right. So how can someone speak for somebody else who has truly been a victim and say it's important to forgive, to forget, and to move on? So I'm aware of that, but I also am aware of the fact that you just don't move on until you deal with the past. The past can either capture you and hold you, or I can set you free. And the choice belongs to you and me. William Sloan Coffin was one of the really great preachers of the 20th century, 1980s and 90s. He was a preacher at the great Riverside Church in New York City. He once wrote these words. I just think this is one of the most powerful things I've ever read. You need to listen carefully. He says, in my experience... There is no worse monkey to carry around on your back than that of a father or mother no longer alive but not yet forgiven. I'm going to read it again, and you can hear it as father or mother or uncle or aunt or other loved one. Let me say it again. In my experience, there is no worse monkey to carry around on your back than that of a father or mother no longer alive but not yet forgiven. People who walk around with such burdens rarely realize that it is precisely what cannot be condoned that must be forgiven. Truer words never spoken. It doesn't make any difference whether you've been a victim or not. If you remain captive to the past, it will ultimately destroy your life. You'll be stuck in a spot forever. And I think the words of Sloan Coffin really help us to understand this. He makes the distinction between being forgiven and being condoned. You never have to condone something that has happened to you, some way in which someone has hurt you. 
but you can forgive it, you can forgive the person, you must, or that event or that person will own you for the rest of your life. If people could get this, our psychotherapists would have half the business that they do now. It's important to forgive and forget and to let go of the past in order to get unstuck enough to move forward. And then Paul says this, I press on. Paul acknowledges that moving forward in life in a really positive way is difficult work. He uses these two uh, verbs, these two active verbs that are interesting. He says, I press on and straining forward. Those are not passive verbs. Those are really active verbs. I press on, straining forward. He knows that moving forward in life can be really, really difficult work. And I think Paul also knows what I have preached about through the years. I, I don't take credit for it. I guess I've learned it from Paul and others. Paul also understands that maybe the most difficult work that we have in terms of moving forward is with the next moment. It's with what I call the starting place. I would so go, for, go so far as to say that the place where we are most resistant to God is at the starting place. And by that, I don't mean the moment that you were baptized or the moment you joined the church or the moment you decided that you were in a new relationship with God. I'm talking about the starting place that lies in front of every single one of us on our spiritual journey today. When you go back and you read the Bible, we've talked about this a lot, when you read the Bible, there is this theme that emerges, and it's all about starting places. Back in January, we preached this series on Moses, and we preached four or five sermons about Moses. But I think the most important point about Moses is that Moses had come to this point where he was really comfortable in life. He wasn't uncomfortable. He was there in the hills of Midian. Midian. He was keeping the sheep for his father-in-law, Jethro. He didn't care anymore about Egypt or about the sins left behind or about the Hebrews still in captivity. He didn't care anymore. He was comfortable. And God came to Moses and said, get up. I've got a place for you to go. It was at the starting point that Moses struggled. Same thing with Abraham and Sarah when God came, came and said, I've got a journey for you to go on. And you can go right through the list of the heroes in the Bible, the prophets and all the others. You can get to the New Testament, and there it is with Joseph and Mary. We talk about this all of the time. Joseph and Mary didn't need God in their lives at that moment. They were engaged. They were in this little town. Things were going okay for them. They didn't need Gabriel showing up. Because the message was, here's a new starting place for you. It isn't going to be comfortable, but it's going to be important. The place where we are most resistant to God is the starting place, the next moment, recognition that this is where God is calling us. Paul knew that only too well. He said, forgetting what lies behind, I press on, straining forward to the vision that God has for my life. And so there it is. These three verses in the 14th verse, we find out what it is that's really pulling Paul forward. It's this vision that God has for us. And we never really get unstuck unless we become convinced and compelled by the power of God's vision for us. In my opinion, that's, that's the whole reason for the book of Revelation at the close of the New Testament. I've read Revelation over and over through the years, and I still can't make much sense of it. Except for this. It's God's statement to us that our lives will be compelled by what is yet to be. That great 21st chapter, every tear will be dried. There will be weeping and mourning no more. It's God's vision of what life will be for us in the end. And that is, I forget what lies behind, I move forward to what God is calling me to be on the way to what the world will be by the grace of Jesus Christ. There's this 
great line in Amos. Amos is one of the minor prophets in the Old Testament. Some of you read Amos, most of you haven't. But there is this great line from, from Amos. God tells Amos to tell his people this. He says, tell your people that I will be a plumb line in their midst. A plumb line. Do you know what a plumb line is? It's a simple device. It's a string with a weight on the end of it. Through the years, I have set a lot of fence posts. Setting a fence post is not much fun, primarily because you've got to dig the hole before you set the post. It's no fun at all. But setting a fence post is a little bit more difficult than most people realize because you want a fence post to be plumb. You want it to be straight. And you may have never thought about this if you've never set a fence post, but it's harder than you think. You can get a level and put it on a fence post, and you will know that it's straight going one direction, but not necessarily the other direction. When I first started building and repairing fences, I didn't get that. So I had fence posts that were straight one way, and I'd look back, and they were, they were crooked the other way. These days, you can go to Home Depot, and you can buy these little levels. They're, they're, fit, they're post levelers, and it's a two-sided level, and you can put it on a rectangular post or a round post either way, and it'll have levels on both sides. And once the, once the, the uh, bubble's in the middle on both of them, you know the post is plumb. It's straight. But before we had Home Depot, we had plumb lines, right? A plumb line's just a string with a, a weight on the end, and you could hold that, and you know it's going to be straight up, perpendicular, straight up and down. You hold it next to your post, and when it matched, you knew your post was plumb. So God said, tell your people that I will be a plumb line in their midst. He was saying to Amos, tell your people that I will be the way in which they measure their lives. I will be the standard by which they understand and evaluate their lives. And that's a pretty powerful thing. So this was Paul's vision. I press forward towards the call in Christ Jesus, the prize in which I am in perfect relationship with my Lord and Savior. When I started thinking about this sermon, this was really the end of the sermon, then I I started thinking about the world in which we live. Last week in one of the services, I ended the the, the service with a benediction. I said, we have become a godless society. Society. I've never said that before. I've spent my whole life trying not to sound like a Baptist preacher. (laughs) But I found myself saying, we have become a godless society, and I believe it. We no longer think about measuring ourselves against some kind of ideal of any kind whatsoever. And I want to say something that I think is contemporary and relevant. I may regret doing this, but I want to say a word about what I think has become a huge issue in our society. And that is social media. Now, don't get upset here. You're going to think I'm just going to, I don't have anything against social media. I will confess to you that, and you know this, I don't do, I don't do Facebook. There's a, somebody, there's a Facebook account in my name. Somebody posts things to it occasionally. Uh, there, I think I've got a Twitter account. I don't know how to log on to my Twitter account, but somebody does something with it now and then. It's not because I'm opposed to social media. I'm not at all. It does, it does great things. We use social media around here all of the time. It's just because I have trouble keeping up with my email. If you send me an email, you're probably going to get a response that says, I'll get back to you as soon as I can. I'm trying to catch up. So that's the only reason I don't do Facebook or tweet, uh, tweet or Snapchat or whatever those other things are, I just don't have time. But there is an issue. There is an issue in our country. It's because we've lost almost all of our standards about how it is we think about our own lives, except in relationship to other human beings. So you think I don't know anything about social media because I don't do it, but I do. In fact, I read the research about social media. 
And I know the harm that's being done to our young people who will go on Facebook or whatever and they'll see, uh, oh, look at this dinner party over here. Wow, it was a lot better than the dinner party I attended. Or look at the va vacation pictures from them. They went to a really cool place. All the selfies that are sent out. We have become a godless society because in so many ways we are comparing ourselves to other people over and over again. We let other people set the standard for how we will measure our lives. God says, I will be the standard for how you measure your life. And look, let me be honest about this. If you're old like me, I don't really care what you do. I really don't care. But I care about what's happening to our young people. To our young women who believe that they're either too fat or too thin, too short or too tall, too short or too tall whatever. I care about what ha happens to our young people who rather than receiving the message that you are a precious child of God and you were made perfect, how tall, how short, how fat, how thin, how smart you are. God made you perfect. That's the standard. And so let's just be honest about that. God says, I will be the standard. And what we know about God is what we professed a minute ago when we baptized these children, each one of them made in the image of God, absolutely perfect. So Paul goes to his knees on the Damascus Road, and when he rises again, when his sight returns, his life has been changed. And he knows the power of forgetting what lies behind. And he knows the power in his own life of taking one step and starting over with God, meeting God at the starting place. And he knows the power of what it means to live his life, letting God become the measure of who he will become. May it be true for every single one of us. Amen.